Hello and welcome back to Phil 210. Today we are going to look at the midterm. Now, I don't want anyone to get nervous about the midterm. It's open book, open note. Um, can do this together with friends. It's not due until April, um, early April. Uh, so mostly I want you to think of the midterm as an opportunity to understand the course a little bit more deeply. All right. So here I am at the landing page, and over here is what we call the navigational panel to the left of the screen. And you'll be checking your assignments to find your way to the midterm assignment. And when you do, and you open it up, uh, you should see something that looks a bit like this. Now you'll notice that each of the questions in here, for the most part, has a source that is of specific importance to answering the questions. So I'm going to read through the questions and we're also going to look at where those sources are. So for example, the first question is a philosophic obstacle is defined as any fundamental belief that blocks logical problem solving and reason. Relativism in relation to defining truth when applied generally to all circumstances has potential to become a philosophic obstacle. The answer to this is in chapters one through five PDF located in week five. It's a true false question. And um, you have to find out uh, two things. Yes, it is actually already true that the answer to this is in chapter uh, one through five in week five. Uh, however, uh, also we need to find out if this, this is true. And in order to do that, we have to go to uh, week five. And and these, unfortunately, students have been having trouble with the links. And that's something I'm going to need to look into. Uh, however, for the moment, I want to recommend that if you look to the right side of the page and go to the section on handouts, uh, review of chapters one through five in, of the, uh, with Socrates, which is our former text, uh, remember, we don't really use that text anymore, though I believe there's still a copy at the library behind the desk. And um, in in this, you would open it, and ideally what you should see is a PDF that looks like this. Now, the thing about this PDF is if you look up here, you'll notice there's one of 115 pages. It's quite a lengthy review. The section you're going to be looking for is on page 70. So I'm up here in this window. It did say one. Now it says 70. I'm going to press the carriage return or enter or return. Okay. Here we have two kinds of obstacles can be distinguished. And it talks about the two kinds of obstacles. You may have to read a little bit more in the chapter to get the answer. But there you are. All right. So let's go back to our uh, course page. And I want to note there's a lot of important information in that uh, PDF view. Okay. Uh, next we have the answer uh, to this uh, is located in the week seven uh, midterm clarification slideshow. So back, back to uh, that. And the following, uh, please complete the following by matching the term with its correct definition. So let's move back past week five. Now going to the navigational panel, I scroll down, I'll notice week seven. I'm gonna go to week seven and I'll notice that under the handout section, we have the impact of colonialist ideology, basic art and design vocabulary, and concepts clarification slideshow. That's what I'm going to be looking for. And in this case, it's a PowerPoint. I'm going to open up that PowerPoint, and it has mid post midterm clarifications. Now, again, my midterm for this course isn't precisely um, or even close to a punitive form of exam. It is meant to be a study session for you, essentially. Uh, so here we have the post midterm clarifications. I am not going to go through this because I want you to go through this. 
uh, if you have not already. But if you look through these slides, you should be able to find the information that will help support uh, your ability uh, to answer the question. So I'm going to reduce this and go back to, apologies, here we are, um, back to our exam process. And so you need to think of the question and find the answer and then match the correct. Now this can be occasionally confusing because visually, right, you, you, one might find oneself wondering, how do I sort this out? So here we have empirical knowledge. It comes from experience. That's one item and it ends with the period. The second option is independent of all particular experience, not derived empirically. And you have a period. Okay, so you'll have to choose for each one of those which it's connected to. All right, then we have, please choose one item from the options available. And in this case, we're talking about Carl Sagan's Bologna Detection Kit article. And you'll find that in handouts in Weegate. So I'm going to come back here again. I go over to the navigational panel where there's Weegate. And then if I scroll down, we'll see that there's a handout section. And we'll notice Carl Sagan's Bologna Detection Kit. Okay. And when you open that, it will help support your ability to answer this question. And please note that um, I've also said to choose only one of the items from the available options here. The next we have, do we always see events in the same way as the person next to us? Is our memory of events objective, subjective, or something betwixt and between? The Rashomon effect is a phenomenon named after Akira Kurosawa's excellent 1950 film, Rashomon, in which a murder is described in four contradictory ways by four different witnesses. In short, the TEDx video about the Rashomon effect, uh, in, in there, there's an introductory quote, remembrance of things past is not necessarily the remembrance of things as they were. So I want us to think about them. And then I've given, there's only one correct answer. Please choose the person that this quote is attributed to, according to the video. And we have some options. Then according to our week eight unit information, which of the following are principles of design and which are elements of art? Now this relates to our discussion under axiology of aesthetics, aesthetics, which has to do with what is beautiful and has to do with our appreciation of forms and art and structures and visual literacy. Okay. So uh, the information that this is applying to is available just below the What is Visual Literacy video. Now, I want to remind everyone to watch that video and then look for the information in the page that's below that video and try to con consider uh, which of these answers is going to match the particular term. Uh, please choose the term that most closely fits with this description based upon course lectures and notes. The context around us is constantly informing the context within us, and vice versa. A classroom, a kitchen, a train station or bus stop, an open lawn enclosed by concrete paths with a, with a sign that says, do not walk on the grass. All of these Spaces become places are telling us what their purpose is. Place is a defined space. Space given a prescriptive purpose that draws upon our understanding of experiential social expectations and thereby recommends to us how we should behave. In this way, space or places are persuasive. Places are rhetorical. The space become place can be rhetorical. In this way, spaces turned places 
potentially legitimate and perpetuate social behavior. This phenomena of reciprocity and relationality is what we term dot, dot, dot. And so then I'm going to ask you to choose from the following a term. So this is from a conference lecture I gave a few years ago. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and give this to you. Typically, uh, I hope students will hazard, I guess. And and in the uh, in the campus-based version, we talk about these different ideas and what they might mean um, for the purposes of an online asynchronous class, I feel like I should be a bit more generous here. So I will tell you that the, the correct answer is spatial rhetoric. However, I do want us to take a moment to think about these different terms and what they might mean. Uh, now, environmental apologetics. Apologetics is a way of explaining something, most often spiritual experience often particularly as it applies to Christianity. But when I'm talking about apologetics as an explanation or justification in terms of environmental, what would I mean by that? Well, I would be talking about how our environment potentially expresses, and our interaction with it, expresses a justification or an explication of the meaning of context. Contextual codependence. All right, now this is a little bit less potentially positive uh, in that uh, it, it's not so much about our spiritual interdependency uh, with an environment as it is about our practical, not always healthy interdependency with particular contextual environments and ways of knowing and being. Now, pavement poaching. There was a wonderful philosopher, uh, Dan Serto, uh, who had this concept of the European approach to space and place being something, um, well, what we would call a bit colonialist by current parlance, uh, colonialist ideology. And he talked about how even the street we're walking down, we often have a sense of, of a relationship of ownership with. And I think we've all been in that position where you you walk to the side of someone who's walking down the street because it's practical. We don't want to run into someone, but it's also considered uh, a courtesy. And if someone doesn't do that, it's a bit of an affront, right? And so some of, of this notion, he then expanded upon the, the idea of the mindset of taking what is not fairly or socially justly one's own. Okay, uh, so pavement poaching. It's actually uh, a, a very informal, loose terminology uh, for how we relate to ownership of space and and the intersection of colonialist, colonialist ideology. All right, uh, and, and to note that not all cultures relate to space and place in the same way. Okay. Uh, Spatial rhetoric is the right answer. Spatial rhetoric right there, that uh, our spatial environs have a persuasive quality about them, particularly when space becomes place. A defined space is a place. And then that, that informs how we might or should behave or respond to it potentially, particularly if we've been socialized to do so. Walkies. Walkies. Well, this is just what my grandmother used to, to say when she was going to take a uh, her her uh, dog for a walk walkies so going for a walk <laughs> basically is a that term and I just uh, threw that in there because I think it's interesting uh, how we communicate with other beings and and our concepts of uh, personal use of space and time and temporal context all right anyway it also makes me smile so it's there uh, Number seven, according to our course lectures, true or false sound is an object. Yes, according to our lectures, I'm going to, to give that one here right now. Um, again, in in lecture, it's pretty easy for a student to understand 
Although I want to know everyone, everyone to know about this, AOS students are not able to be present at live lectures. So how would you know? Uh, the answer is true. For the purposes of this course, sound is an object. It is a waveform, a disruption of the air interpreted by our ears as a thing. Okay, so so for the purposes of our course, the answer to this is true. All right. According to the lecture notes, and these can be found in week four notes. So again, right, if you were scanning through, you would come up here and you would find week four in the navigational panel. And you would scroll down. Now we're gonna look just at the side to our immediate right side panel and you'll see week four notes. And when you open those notes, it should help you answer a particular Sam question. But let's go ahead and say it anyway. Precise definition of beauty and understanding of what is beautiful requires us to place beauty in context. To explain what beauty means in terms of our daily social life and in terms of social justice. Okay, so uh, that is in week four notes. And yes, it is something that if it's in week four notes, I wrote <laughs> and lectured on. <sighs> All right, uh, pardon. Uh, let's continue with please identify who said the following. I want to emphasize that this is meant to be a learning experience. It's not an exam in the, in the classical sense. Um, the end of term comprehensive is more of a strict traditional exam, although you still have open book, open note, and plenty of time to take it in your own time. Uh, it opens, um, actually it opens just after spring break. So you'll have time to preview it. You can save as you go, all of those things. I'm only saying that to tell you that, that this midterm is meant to be a deep breath when a letting go of stress, a review of what we've we've talked about so far some of those more important concepts before we move into the second half of the course. All right. Please identify who said the following. Like all tools, the baloney detection kit can be misused, applied out of context, or even employed as a rote alternative to thinking. Yet when applied judiciously, it can make all the difference in the world not the least in evaluating our own arguments before we present them to others. Okay, the answer to this is to be found in Carl Sagan's Baloney Detection Kit article, which is in the handouts in week eight, which we've looked at before. Now I have uh, several possibilities here. We have Amy Winehouse, Trevor Noah, Carl Sagan, Maria Popova, and Mahu Okuya. So, I would say go through uh, the baloney kit and decide which individual that quote is attributable to according to the article. Okay, number 10, please match the vocabulary terms to their appropriate definition. Now this is where it can again get confusing, but each one of these sentences is a possible response, a possible match to that particular term or, or words or terms. And uh, you have an opportunity uh, to choose. And don't necessarily, there we go. Uh, don't necessarily um, immediately or just assume the answer. Give, give some time to think it through. And if you have one that you don't know or isn't familiar, these can be from any of our readings, pretty much. Uh, what I would do is I would take a moment and start with the things I feel fairly certain about, about. And then by process of elimination, I would go back and choose between the others. Uh, it's also perfectly fine to seek our online support from this. But do be careful. Make sure that if you seek help from an online source that isn't a part of our course, it is a laudable source. All right, then we have five tips to improve clinical thinking from the supplemental video in week seven, with the same name. So back here again, 
week seven. We'll note that there is scrolling down the center of the page, five tips to improve your critical thinking. And from that video, I'm asking you, based on having watched that video, I suggest a process that these five tips might apply to. For example, writing a song, planning a family vacation, or writing a paper. And please explain the actions or information that each tip, as they call it, or step uh, completion might necessarily in include. So how would you actually go through those five steps. So take, for example, the first step, and then how would that translate into a practical uh, context of completing it? So if you chose writing a paper, how does that first step help with writing the paper? What would it mean? What would you have to do? How does that second step translate into a practical action? Third, fourth step, fifth step. Okay. If you have any questions at all, please do email me about that. Students may write their responses or respond using a video and audio recording, features of uh, MyHeritage or alternatively applications of their own. So what am I talking about? Look here, we have a video camera and we have an audio recorder. If you select this, it will take audio and video. You have a camera on, on your device and it will record your response. If you are shy about the image, you could just press this and it will record the audio of your voice. Or perhaps you find it just as easy to write in the box. Uh, whatever works for you uh, in your ability to communicate the answer to this question is acceptable and, and wonderful, in fact. Okay, uh, again, if you have any questions about this midterm exam, please email to me um, during the spring break. I might not get back to you immediately, but I will be checking a couple of times during spring break. Um, and then after spring break, well, I will certainly be, be checking right away. And this is again not due until the very beginning of April. Okay. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And I look forward to discussing ideas with you uh, via our, our forums, or if you're a synchronous um, learner at our campus based on campus. And I do hope that you have a wonderful break. Thank you so much.